In today's episode, we have psychotherapists Tom and Sherry Eckert, founders of the Oregon Psilocybin Society and the co-creators of the Psilocybin Service Initiative, PSI 2020, a ballot petition that they created for the 2020 election in Oregon. Stay tuned to hear more about legal psilocybin therapy in Oregon. Welcome to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin, here to bring you cutting-edge interviews with leading scientists, entrepreneurs, and medical professionals who are exploring how we can integrate psychedelics in an intentional and responsible way for both healing and transformation. It is my honor and privilege to bring you these episodes as you get deeper and deeper into why these medicines are so critical to the future of humanity. So let's go. And let's see what we can explore and learn together in this incredibly important time. Hey, listener, we have great news. Third Wave is rolling out another microdosing experience program, a live six-week group coaching program that uses microdosing and intentional ceremony as tools for accelerated growth. We guide you through two weeks of preparation, a breakthrough ceremony, and four weeks of microdosing to elevate your mood, reduce your anxiety, and help you feel a deeper sense of connection to those around you. Spots for the program are limited to 50 people, and our next cohort begins Sunday, October 4th. If you're interested in more details, go to our homepage, click Academy, and click Microdosing Experience. We've also linked to it in the show notes of this episode. Third Wave's podcast is brought to you by Magic Mind, called Silicon Valley's New Morning Elixir by Forbes. Do you want more creativity, flow, and energy in your day-to-day routine? Then go to magicmind.co and get the two-ounce shot that contains 12 magical ingredients scientifically designed to improve your productivity. I've been using Magic Mind over the last couple months to reduce my morning coffee, and it works like a charm. With matcha, lion's mane, and several other nootropics, it lifts you up and doesn't burn you out. So if you're interested in Magic Mind, go to magicmind.co and enter promo code THIRDWAVE to get 10% off your first order. Today's episode is with Tom and Sherry Eckert, who are both psychotherapists in the state of Oregon. They founded the Oregon Psilocybin Society, and the main goal of the Oregon Psilocybin Society is to bring psilocybin services to Oregon. The Eckert's pursuit of this goal is spearheaded by their work on the Psilocybin Service Initiative, also called IP. 34, which has now collected enough signatures to be put on the ballot for the 2020 election. So that means the state of Oregon will vote on whether or not they will legalize psilocybin therapy, which is incredibly, incredibly exciting and so, so important. You know, psilocybin is decriminalized in Denver, Oakland, and Santa Cruz. But decriminalization has a much different framework than legal psilocybin therapy. And so we recorded this podcast, I believe back in May, it was quite some time ago, as a way to help build awareness because of COVID. They, they meaning the Oregon Psilocybin Society, Tom and Sherry, IP34, had to move from collecting signatures in person to doing it all online. And so we recorded this podcast. We talked about the initiative. We talked about the importance of the container for legal psilocybin therapy. We talked about the particulars around how therapy would work. So who could do it, who couldn't do it, who could get access to it, what the cost would be. We talked about some of the controversy that arose between Dr. Bronner's and the OPS and some of the decrim advocates, because there are so many different sort of people who are now coming into this space. And more than anything, had a chance to really connect at a heart level with Tom and Cherry, who are both kind, kind, beautiful souls who are doing such important work in the state of Oregon. I mean, folks, if we can legalize psilocybin therapy in a state like Oregon, then there's no reason why we can't take that same model, prove its success in a legal framework, and then apply it to states like New York or Illinois or Washington or California or Hawaii or other countries even. So making sure that this gets passed, that awareness is raised about it, is so fundamental to giving people the access that they need to fucking heal because mushrooms heal. They really do. Okay. Without any further ado, I bring you Tom and Sherry Eckert of the Oregon Psilocybin Society. Hey, listeners, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm sitting virtually across from Tom and Sherry Eckert of the 
Oregon Psilocybin Therapy Campaign. Tom and Cherie, thanks so much for, for joining us. Hey, it's our pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, we're very full of gratitude to be on with you, Paul. It's quite an initiative that you all have taken on, and I know you've been working on it for quite some time. I would just love to start with like a little bit of the origin story. You know, how did this come about? What inspired your work? You know, with IP thirty four and this initiative? Yeah, it has been a kind of a long and probable journey at this point. It's great to be in the place we're at, looking at the possibility of moving this into a statewide program to legalize access to psilocybin therapy. You know, looking back in the real view. It's all started because we're therapists and we're uh, interested in healing and growth and self-development and also psychedelics. And back in what, 2015, uh, we started really tuning into the research that was happening. Specifically, I remember with the article that came out in the New Yorker, Michael Pollan, kind of a precursor to his great book. Uh, the article was called The Trip Treatment. Yeah. And it gave this kind of wide angle view of what was happening in psychedelic research, which back then wasn't really widely reported on. And it really struck us. And of course, it's Michael Pollan writing. So he conveyed the kind of emotional, profound effects of the of the treatment that was happening. So Shuri and I, our, our angle on therapy has always been, you know, what is personal transformation all about? We believe that it doesn't come from the outside. It really is kind of an inner healer type process. So our outlook, I think, always dovetailed with psychedelic philosophy and, and kind of the how that happens. But of course, psychedelics bring a layer to therapeutic gain that we had never seen. I mean, we kind of understood that from personal experience, but to see it represented in the science was really inspiring. I think that as therapists, we know our goal when sitting with clients is to help them discover their own inner therapist. And because they do their own healing, we don't heal others, they heal themselves. And so psychedelics and all of the clinical studies that have shown how psychedelics work to help individuals get to that inner therapist really quickly has been really inspiring to Tom and I. And like you said, in 2015, we knew that this was going to be a shift in the way that people were treated for mental health issues and addiction crisis. And we were very ambitious, I think, to help find a way to get this type of novel treatment into the general public that is safe for them that is safe for the facilitators. And the key thing about the research, you know, speaking of the inner healer, that's balanced with careful facilitation. So it's a really interesting model that the kind of therapeutic facilitation of this experience is pretty much a hands-off thing, but it involves preparation and assessment to make sure there are no contraindications, to make sure that this is the right fit because psychedelics really aren't for everybody in terms of healing and growth. There's an art to that. And it's kind of this humanistic approach to facilitation where you are guiding, but not directive in a directive fashion. And there's a way to do that to really optimize and maximize benefits and really take care of all the potential risks. And those risks are real. But when you put it in a therapeutic container, it really mitigates and optimizes. And so that was really exciting to us to uh, create a framework to allow that to happen and bring that into the culture in such a way that it's really hard to argue against when you understand what this is. You know, uh, one of the things about our start that I find uh, to be really special to both Tom and I is that we actually consulted psilocybin. We consulted the mushroom. We sat and asked, what are the main things that need to be inside of a community-based framework that will help us to achieve the goal of helping people help themselves. And it was really a wonderful thing to be able to, in unity, sit down and kind of put out that basic outline that took eventually a whole year to actually draft. So a couple of things are coming up for me. I think the first point of clarification is, you know, a lot of people have been hearing about FDA breakthrough approval status for psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression and major depressive disorder. We've seen that. I think Compass Pathways is for treatment-resistant depression. Eustona is for major depressive disorder. 
We've also seen, you know, decriminalization movements of psilocybin and general plant medicines in places like Denver and Oakland and Santa Cruz and potentially dozens more cities in the next year or so. You know, in terms of like IP34 and some of the specifics of it, how is it different and how is it similar to, you know, those two movements that we've seen, you know, developing concurrent? You know, we really preach kind of a, a unity um, message in terms of that there's one psychedelic movement with different levels that reach a potential outcome in the culture. And so on the FDA level, you have the moving through a process of approval to bring psychedelics into a medical frame. We all owe the researchers and the teams and the supporters a huge debt of gratitude. We wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't for the heroic efforts of the scientists, as well as the supporters, it's all privately funded, to put us in a position to even be talking about how to integrate psychedelics into the culture. So that's hugely important, and we support it wholeheartedly. Coming down a level into the statewide therapeutic approach that's happening in Oregon that we're spearheading, we think that is a important movement in the direction of accessibility, because what we're doing is we're saying, uh, psilocybin therapy is shown to have an excellent safety track record, okay? And with proper assessment and, and um, screening and preparation, uh, this is a uh, modality that is hugely beneficial, not just for people with particular mental health diagnoses, but for the general public with some exceptions. Um, so if we bring in people... Basically, a, an, an inspiration for us was to uh, bring this into a frame that could um, help as many people as possible. And so through a statewide initiative, we're not, um, we're not beholden to the same restrictions that the FDA process imposes, right? And so we want to be very responsible with that potential and do this in a way that, that's safe and smart and intelligent and optimizes the experience. But at the same time, uh, widen the tent or open the tent up to, to more people who can benefit because, uh, you know, our whole country has issues, obviously, and mental health is a huge problem. And especially in Oregon, we have uh, some of the highest rates, if not the highest rate of mental illness in the country. So we're trying to bring real change and real healing to Oregon. And I think that starts a template. You know, I love the way that we see the psychedelic movement as a whole and the different components within it. And we know that each one serves different purposes. And so as Tom was sharing, the FDA uh, breakthrough status, if it passes and it becomes available to the public, it's going to be to a very small percentage you have a specific diagnosis is what we're saying. And so what we want to do is to, uh, basically as Tom shared, to expand the accessibility, but to do it in such a way that's compatible to and paralleled with the clinical trials so that we are following the safety and the standard practices and the ethics and all of the things that they have so rigorously established in the clinical studies. And a regulatory backstop is really important in the sense of how do you deal with malpractice abuses that happen? This provides a way to bring competency to the space that we think is very important. Now, going down to the decriminalization level, here in Oregon, there's actually an interesting uh, potential on the horizon. So there's not only our statewide initiative, but there is a statewide initiative to create more access to addiction services and also decriminalizing all drugs across the board in small amounts, kind of like Portugal. So what we have in Oregon is this kind of two-pronged drug policy reform agenda, separate campaigns, but will be on the ballot hopefully this November. And so you have legalized access to carefully provided psilocybin-assisted therapy, as well as a baseline of decriminalization across the board that really cuts the legs out from the failed drug war. A change is drug policy. So it's drug policy reform, Portugal style, but it moves, you know, it moves further. It, it also makes sure to ensure that there's care and a recovery access for people who might otherwise wind up in jail when they really need to be in therapy. All of this is part of the bigger picture of moving toward a public health-based approach to, 
to drug use. And that's what makes sense. And I think that's what the country is looking for. And I think Oregon's the tip of the spear, but just the beginning. So when we go and look at, you know, how Oregon is the tip of the spear, right? The first state to be doing something that's this comprehensive. There's obviously the decrim movement for all of California, but that is different. We'll, we'll set that aside because it doesn't come with the same sort of emphasis on the therapeutic approach, if you will. And, you know, with, for example, Compass and USONA, what they're looking at from an FDA approval process is, from what I understand, prescription by a medical professional, a psychiatrist, for a specific clinical condition, and that the medicine psilocybin is synthetic. Right, that it's a that it's basically a molecule. In terms of you know those specifics with your campaign and your initiative, is it a synthetic? Is it the whole mushroom? And then, you know, with maps, with a lot of the clinical research that they've done at NYU on psilocybin, it's been two therapists for every one patient, and we know that the scalability of that is limited. So um, a couple of years ago, I started a, a retreat center in the Netherlands called Synthesis. And so what we did with synthesis is we did group settings where it was 15 people with, you know, about five facilitators. So I'd just be curious to hear like one whole plant versus molecule. And then two, how are you thinking about the therapeutic approach in terms of facilitators to people who are actually going through? Let's start out with just what therapeutic is. It's not only for treating mental health or addiction issues. Therapeutic can be your personal development as a human being that is a part of the therapeutic process, personal growth and development. So we have to make sure that we understand what that word in and of itself means first. And then in regards to our initiative, we were very careful to, we understand that the FDA in order to run clinical trials have to have very strict guidelines to do that in order to prove what they're trying to prove. In Oregon, what we have done is we have just basically ensured that the natural mushroom can be used if that is the desire of the facilitator. Also that it's okay if somebody wants to synthesize or just maybe extract the natural molecules. And so it's a variety of ways that can take place. But I think the most important thing is that we did protect the ability to use nature's natural fungi. We put a clause in there that basically says that the Oregon Health Authority, which is the health authority here, can't mandate exclusive use of synthetic. The natural mushroom, natural organic extracts will always be in the mix. And I foresee that as where it's going for a variety of reasons. One is that another clause in the language really puts the brakes on kind of corporate pharma intrusion in Oregon. You know, we'll see how it plays out, but I think what I foresee is kind of facilitators and therapy centers creating their own product to standards. So you can, there's a, a few different licenses involved. You become licensed as a service center. We call it like a therapy center. You can become licensed as a facilitator. We can talk more about that, what that entails. It's not locked up in hospitals. It's not just doctors, that kind of thing. Also as a producer. So you can hold more than one license. So I would imagine that a treatment center like Synthesis would hold all those licenses and develop, you know, their own organic. And, you know, we kind of see behind the scenes, some of the technology that's being developed uh, with regard to organic extraction and really uh, cleaning up the questions around dosage and things like that uh, without going synthetic. So that's kind of the horizon I see in Oregon, at least. I like to point out that everybody has a different way of wanting to receive this type of therapy, this type of care, right? Some people have uh, want to approach it from a very clinical standpoint. They want to make sure that they're in an environment that feels clinical to them. It feels like I, this, it feels safe. This is the container for me. And others might uh, want to have a, a different kind of more sacred spiritual type of environment. And the initiative allows for the service centers to determine their aesthetics to their clients. And I think that's really important because again, individuals 
feel safe in different environments. Yeah, the regs are really around safety and best practice standards, but that can look like a lot of different things. So there's kind of an open marketplace and there should be, you know, this is what it means to run a statewide campaign rather than just preaching to the choir of psychedelic folks. You know, we're, we're trying to meet the needs of a big uh, potential market, for lack of a better term, people who are looking for healing and new options for uh, mental health care as well as personal growth. But because we put these limitations on how many service centers can be owned and how many production centers can be owned, we see this more as a community-based initiative so that rather than being, people often think, well, if the OHA is involved, then this is a state thing, but it's not. The state will issue the licenses. Uh, People do need to have training in order to become a licensed facilitator or a licensed service center or a licensed production center. Tom can go into all the reasons why, but I think that, you know, by limiting what can happen commercially, the commodification of the medicine itself and expanding the way that services can take place is a perfect kind of blend. We created a framework that isn't driven by corporate influence. It's not driven by the state per se. That's the spirit of what we're what we're trying to do. Like Sheree said, a community-based framework where we can help each other to heal with an emphasis on competence, practice standards, and ethics. But otherwise, well, including that, bringing in the spirit of the the psychedelic movement that's been developing since way back in the 50s and, of course, has ancient roots in ceremonial use. The 60s were kind of a blip on the r- radar in a bigger story, and that story has always emphasized care and structure. That's what we want to bring to Oregon in a fashion that makes sense in our, in our era. Mm. I think also when you really do your research about how psychedelic medicines have been used in and uh, indigenous cultures, there's always been structure. They use the medicine uh, with purpose, with intention. And we can see that uh, at least people here in North America are really desirous to kind of enter into that spirit of the ancient wisdom and the, the sense of sacredness that you can get. And we see them flocking to other places where it's legal to get these services. And so our goal is to be able to create our own culture, something that resonates with us that is inclusive of its ancient sacred use and what we know to be true in terms of research and what the clinical researchers are establishing. And so it's us trying to form a rite of passage in a sense for us Westerners, so to say. When we hold on to that spirit of what this initiative is about, it becomes clearer that it's not to exclude anything. We're simply trying to create our own way to access this experience in our environment legally. One word that comes up for me is, is you know, the word integration. So whenever we're looking at creating balance, between opposites. What has come up in our conversation is like both, you know, modern science driven by what's research has been done by Johns Hopkins, as well as the indigenous practices that have been going on for thousands and thousands of years, right? To create best practices, we have to both honor this sort of, you know, ancestral heritage and, you know, the the tools that we have available to us in, in 2020. You know, the other thing that comes up is, you know, even when we look at sort of the legal model that you're developing, you know, it takes elements from sort of that FDA, the therapeutic care, you know, there needs to be structure, there needs to be licensing, there needs to be some of these things. And we need people to be able to grow their own medicine, we need to decommodify substances, we need to ensure that, you know, people can charge a fair price for the service they provide, from an energetic perspective, but that they're not, you know, manipulating or, you know, over-corporatizing some of these things, because that ultimately just extracts a lot of the healing potential from these substances when they're used within that container in that sense. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, there is a lot of underground work already being done with, uh, with mushrooms, with psilocybin. And what we really hope as therapists is to see people who are currently licensed as therapists 
doing the work to be able to legally do this, as well as those who aren't licensed but are doing the work to get the appropriate training so that they are competent, as Tom shared, to perform these these services and to do so uh, with accountability. And we think that's important, which is why the OHA part of it is really important to have, uh, if a person doesn't feel safe right now and, and they're getting underground care, they have no one they can go to and say something happened. And this is especially important being that this opens up a very psychologically vulnerable space, as we know, uh, for those of us have, that have explored it. Um, yeah, I think that competence, and by the way, when we talk about competence and, um, you know, bringing, the, bringing um, uh, different skills to this, it's not based on prior credentialing. It's not, you're not competent just because you have an MD or something like that. This is a new space. And so this is one of those steps we took that was kind of a, a big step was to create standalone licensure for psilocybin facilitation unique set of skills you know if you have the heart and discipline to get in this work this is this is the avenue and it's not about uh, you know having already holding a bunch of degrees and that's interesting and that's very unique because you know we've seen with programs like at cis that you have to be you know a clinical licensed professional for example to become and, and get the degree for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy can you go a little bit deeper into that? Like, what's the structure of that? Who can enroll? Who will be able to enroll in something like this? What sort of training are they going through? Because obviously, someone who goes through a professional training for like becoming a licensed therapist, the training they go through is like learning how to hold space and learning to mirror and learning, you know, how to guide that process of going inwards. So someone who might just be, you know, have no context whatsoever, isn't going to have the same level of, they're not going to start from the same baseline, essentially. So like, how are you approaching, you know, that? context? Well, in the initiative, we open the doors for people who want to get licensed as a facilitator to to apply for that um, upon, they have to be over 21. They ha- uh, the, the education requirement is a high school diploma. In addition to that, though, is this extensive training that will be developed that will uh, prepare them just exactly as you say to be competent in this specific discipline and so it might be that someone comes into uh, the the field wanting with no education in psychology or psychiatry uh, and they really want to do this I suspect that there will be more required of them in terms of training and there'll, there will be um, ethics that basically state if this is if somebody's coming to you and it's outside of what your um, competency level is, the, you're, you, you need to refer to someone to whom it is within their competency. The training aspect of it is really critical and it's what's going to make this really work so that everyone is getting the same type of treatment with the same type of intelligence and knowledge about what they're going into but also realizing they may not have all of the the skill sets that it takes to address somebody with perhaps, let's say, suicidality or or clinical depression that might need to come to someone, licensed professional therapist like Tom or like all of us who are practicing therapy as a profession. So the key thing is that it'll be an intensive training program and we're developing criteria to advise the Oregon Health Authority on. It's ultimately up to the Oregon Health Authority to set those uh, criteria into place and they will be listening to an advisory board. That advisory board will be eventually appointed by the Oregon Health Authority, but we've kind of moved forward with developing a prototype board and you might recognize some of the names on that board, including Robin Carhart Harris and Hayden. Mark Hayden and uh, Paul Stamets. Uh, he's Francois. more on the production side. Francoise Borzot, who wrote the great book Consciousness Medicine. So really, and Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, who has been like you know the big. He's the head of the uh, Center for Psychedelic Studies at yeah. Imperial College in London. Yeah, and he's like they they've been doing all of those amazing studies that are really helping us to understand how the brain works and what's going on. So it's a really great board of advisors that are going to work uh, kind of preemptively. That's to- that's actually an active board. It's not a name only board. We are meeting and 
and developing training criteria. And those folks were chosen, with the exception of Paul, who we're working with on the production side of things, of course, and who better to go to than Paul for that. But with Robin and Francoise and Mark and ourselves, we are uh, working on, well, we went to them specifically because of their experience and knowledge and wisdom pertaining to training. And so we are trying to develop kind of the intelligentsia around training specifically, because I really see that as the beating heart of this whole initiative. The whole point is to create access and competency so that we can move this forward into the culture in an intelligent way that doesn't exclude anyone and opens up this kind of healing in such a way that mitigates the risks. You know, there's a lot of moving parts to that, but essentially that's what it is. You know, sometimes it gets kind of over-talked and it's just, we got to remember that this is about bringing psychedelic therapy to uh, our culture in a smart way. Just to re-emphasize what Tom touched on, risk is important. There are risks. So while it's open to anyone, they do have to go through risk assessment. They do have to be evaluated for contraindications. Harm reduction is an extremely big part of the training. Being able to provide safety is obviously very, very, very important. It's like top, top in importance, right? We want to make sure that, as Paul stated at one of the conferences that we spoke with him at, this is a very strong, powerful medicine for healing. And because of its the vulnerability that people have when they're experiencing psilocybin, there needs to be structure around it. Another thing that's happening in our initiative is that once the, the initiative passes, the Oregon Health, Asi- uh, Oregon Health Authority is charged with creating an advisory board to help them. Yeah. And so that's what this advisory board is, ho- we're hoping to see, show them and model for them and even see some, some of the people get, get on. Yeah, we hope that kind of just moves <laughs> into the, the program. At some point, we kind of let go and it starts to become its thing. Um, but we're trying to set it up such that the right people are there uh, to to help this along. And we're succeeding in that, uh, uh, getting a lot of good input as to how to move forward in the best possible way. Well, and a lot of what you're talking about are really systems of education. We've had research on psychedelics since the 50s and 60s. We've been using psychedelics for potentially tens of thousands of years, meaning we have a, you know, a, again, sort of a built-in evolutionary relationship with these substances. And yet, in 2020, you know, the, the biggest gap still to mainstream adoption of psychedelic medicine is simply stigma and ignorance around the proper and responsible use of them. And, you know, that's one reason why, even with Third Wave and some of our work, we focused so much on microdosing as a topic, less because of the maybe clinical and therapeutic and more just from behavioral psychology perspective that, you know, it's easier to facilitate adoption because people ultimately make emotional decisions and then afterwards rationalize it with clinical research. And so I think the easier you can make it for people to take that first step, the better. And obviously who better, like Tom mentioned, than Paul Stamets in terms of leading up production. Paul has um, pioneered what's now colloquially referred to as the Stamets stack, which is psilocybin, lion's mane, and niacin. So I'd just be curious to hear, like, how are you thinking about microdosing, you know, within this initiative? Will it be feasible for people to purchase microdosing supplements and use them within a therapeutic context? What's sort of the the context on that with, with how this is becoming available? Well, wouldn't that be great, Paul, if that were a possibility? Unfortunately, because we are using the clinical research as a grounds for why this initiative should pass. Um, There's not been enough research on microdosing and it would be great. I'd love to see the stack be available. Yeah, it's kind of like not our focus so much simply because, you know, that there's a particular kind of framework and structure that you have to wrap around the macrodose. And of course, there is a lot of science behind it. And we do kind of see the experiential component as such the healing space. That said, I put nothing beyond the mushroom. <laughs> you know, there's a very, very the, the microdosing uh, approach may turn out to be highly effective. Certainly a lot of anecdotal evidence and some evidence coming in, and I hope that continues. The first step, you know, as, as we're all collectively working on different angles, is to destigmatize and bring uh, more and more information. Of course, 
we talk about the risks of the macrodosing, of course, psilocybin itself isn't physiologically risky. It's not toxic. So we don't want to mislead people on that. But when we're doing big doses with people who are working through big issues, you know, you have a potential for things to go sideways as kind of a what we call behavioral toxicity. And that's why we like to we, we talk about keeping this in a container with professionals that know how to handle any situation that may come up, thereby mitigating those kind of risks. Microdosing is a different picture. I see no reason why that train shouldn't continue. And um, I, I, all the best to people who are working on that issue. But we're, we're focused on our particular frame. I want to be curious as well how that fits in, you know, whether it's microdosing or whether it's lifestyle changes like diet and exercise and sleep or whether it's you know um, modalities like breath work or meditation you know part of facilitating an effective aftercare integration period is lifestyle changes what we know from at least preliminary research and just you know the effects that we know psychedelics have on the brain like the 5-HT2A receptor we know that and Paul has talked about this extensively on the Joe Rogan podcast and other things that microdosing could significantly help with facilitating neuroplasticity mm -hmm. uh, and adaptability. So I would just be curious, you know, how that starts to play a role, less so in the experiential element, because I think the high doses are really necessary for that for people to go totally inwards and to have that healing experience, but more so in the aftercare period as a supporting modality for continued like health and flourishing and integration. I think it's a great hypothesis and great direction. I think that this is why we need to support both bills here in the state of Oregon to decriminalize as well as legalize access to therapy. And with that loosening, we can start to have these conversations and bring them out of just conversations and start thinking about how to create the structures that make the optimal healing experiences possible. Yeah, I think it's important to note that this campaign does not legalize psilocybin it's what it does is it legalizes the ability to use psilocybin within a certain framework. Outside of that framework, psilocybin is still illegal. The framework that we have, again, uh, proposed is the therapeutic framework. And so that's the macrodosing. Yeah. You know, one thing that's probably coming up for a lot of people is pushback. Pharmaceutical companies or, you know, anti-drug people or, you know, anyone who sort of is, quote unquote, against, you know, drug policy or, or the legal, which seems to be fewer and fewer people every day. But I'd just be curious, you know, have you faced any sort of pushback? Have you faced, you know, any sort of major resistance? What sort of been maybe a negative response if there has been any whatsoever? There's been no financed opposition to our campaign as of yet. And we hope that it stays that way. It would be hard to absorb serious opposition, but uh, I don't think that it's on the radar at that level. Uh, and there hasn't really been much opposition, even just from leaders in the community or whatnot. So we're kind of cruising along and just making our points and educating the public. That's our biggest challenge is to educate the state regarding what this is and what this isn't. So the opposition, if there is any, just kind of in general out there, then the folks that haven't gotten on board yet, are generally based on lack of understanding. We've done some interesting focus groups where we bring in people and have these dis long discussions and kind of scientifically pull apart how people change their minds and things like that. Hey listeners, unfortunately we had a bit of an issue with this audio file after about 40 minutes for whatever reason uh, became corrupted. So we have to cut this interview short. With that being said, we would love, love, love if you can go and check out the Oregon Psilocybin initiative that Tom and Sherry have gained enough signatures now to get it on the ballot and now are starting a big promotional push to really, really get the word out about the importance of legalizing psilocybin therapy in Oregon. So if you know of anyone who lives in Oregon, who's interested in psilocybin therapy, who can continue to help support and promote the work that they're doing, please pass along this podcast or any of the information that we will include in the show notes for this episode. So have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you so much for listening to Third Waves Podcast.